Okay, cool. So waiting for everyone to connect. Okay, let's start. So welcome everyone to this month's installation of our, I can't believe it's not better, seminar series. Uh, we're quite happy that we have Masha as a speaker today. Uh, Masha is a postdoc at INRIA in Grenoble in the Statify team and also currently on the job market, I believe. Uh, her research focuses mostly on exploring distributional properties of Bayesian neural networks, some of which uh, she's going to talk about today. Um, and more specifically, she's interested in explaining the difference between deep learning models of wide and shallow regimes in order to improve the interpretability and efficiency of these models. And so we're looking very much forward to hearing more about that now. Um, thank you, Masha, for, for being here. Yes. Yeah, so, um, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for invitation. Um, I'm very happy to present you today my work and uh, some thoughts about that and uh, maybe a bit of connection. So uh, my goal would be mostly to show uh, what we achieved, uh, the way how we were thinking um, and uh, what it lead us like to see what what's in the end, what were the reality, what was the reality. So let's start. I, I just noticed that it's the wrong date, I guess, <laughs> my slide. So uh, let's start, it's at 24th of October. <laughs> so I'll start briefly with uh, just mostly the introduction uh, about uh, the neural networks and Bayesian neural networks so that everybody uh, will be into the topic. And then I move uh, uh, into more details. So uh, as you may all know that uh, the field of artificial intelligence now is growing and then growing and we have a lot of uh, applications and uh, uh, especially uh, uh, in the image recognition, neural language processing, speech recognition and so on. And so we're uh, interested in the subfield of artificial intelligence, which is called machine learning, which uh, the goal of which is to um, learn uh, to to make the algorithms uh, work uh, to perform as humans um, and uh, mostly uh, we're focused on the subfield of machine learning which is called deep learning and uh, deep learning is uh, based uh, on the models um, called uh, artificial neural networks so i will start to describe the artificial neural networks a bit more in details. So uh, these are the, uh, the models, which you can see uh, on the slide. So we have an input layer, uh, we denoted by X. We have several hidden layers, um, and uh, we have an output layer. And so in hidden layers, we have hidden units. So we call them units. And uh, uh, each uh, hidden unit is a linear combination of the outputs of the previous layer and the coefficients of these linear combinations are called weights and we denote them by w's and then uh, we have a nonlinear function we apply a nonlinear function which is called the uh, activation function uh, and it would be an output of the hidden layer so which is sometimes also post, post nonlinearity and also the important notions would be the width so the number of hidden units per layer and the depth the number of uh, hidden layers uh, so, and uh, what was important uh, that uh, in neural networks that, uh, so we needed to define the architecture of neural network, uh, like uh, we can have different hidden layers, uh, such as convolutional, residual, and so on, and we need to define a training procedure, which can be also uh, uh, defined in different way, the way how to update our weights, how to train our weights. And this gives a nice property such as expressivity, good adaptive bias, generalization ability. Uh, though it has some limitations, uh, such as we still consider neural network as a black box. So we cannot really trace back the path from the input to the output. And it doesn't provide a reliable uncertainty, which uh, in some applications it's very important, such as uh, um, medical diagnosis, self-driving cars, and so on. And therefore, we have some problems with the interpretability and trust in, into such neural networks. 
So, and uh, what we say that um, maybe bias can be a solution to the last two problems. Like uh, if there is a natural way to provide um, uh, uncertainty estimates and uh, therefore uh, it can deal with uh, trust, it can increase the trust uh, in, in the model. So, and uh, that's why we consider the Bayesian approach to neural networks. So in Bayesian approach, we uh, assume that there is a, a prior distribution on the weights. So the weights now follow some distribution. And then uh, we I can- found this on the web. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and then uh, we propagate the weights in the neural network. And uh, then our output of the hidden units, they also follow some distributions. And in the end, the output of the Bayesian neural network could be distribution. So in this case, a uh, neural network could provide us with uncertainty. And uh, in case of Bayesian neural network, so we can keep the architecture of a neural network uh, and we need to change the training procedure. So now we need to approximate this output distribution. So it would be, uh, which is called posterior distribution. So we need to approximate uh, the posterior. And uh, it helps to, keep the nice properties of the neural networks in general, uh, the expressivity, the conductive bias, generalizationability, uh, though it still has some issue with the uh, uh, transparency, so with a black box problem. And this was mostly the goal. Uh, so what was interesting uh, for me, it's to try to open this black box to, to understand the, uh, a bit more about what is going on in neural networks and to get some insights. So this was the main motivation. Uh, of course, it's uh, quite a big and it's impossible. Um, I hope at some point we will understand much more, uh, but the main the main goal is this one. So, and uh, I really like the, this uh, citation. Uh, there is nothing uh, so practical as a good theory. And uh, I believe this was uh, 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 my motto that motivated me during my PhD. Uh, so, okay, let's start uh, a bit more details. So uh, the main, uh, uh, I would say the main starting point was, uh, so I started my PhD in 2018. And then this year, there was a, a paper connecting Bayesian neural networks and Gaussian processes, two papers. And this was a starting point of my PhD. And uh, so I will tell you about this paper with more details, and then I move to our research, and then on the perspectives. So um, it's actually started much before in the 90s with Anil, who showed the first the connection between Bayesian neural networks and Gaussian processes. So Gaussian processes are uh, well-studied uh, um, Bayesian models. So, uh, and it was quite exciting to find this connection. Uh, and uh, the connection is the following. So if we have an infinite number of hidden units uh, in the layer, then a neural network would tend to a Gaussian process. Under the assumption that the priors on the weights are Gaussian, uh, so there is uh, um, some um, restrictions on the uh, variance. So we need to divide on the num by the number of the hidden units in the layer, uh, and the, it should be uh, zero mean. So, and then uh, in 2018, there were two papers that show that it's actually true. Uh, if we have uh, um, infinite number of hidden units, per more than two layers. So if we go further, we will still have uh, the limit to the Gaussian process. And just as uh, we use uh, like a central limit theorem for exchangeable variables, or if we, uh, in the second paper, they showed the kernel, uh, how, how to estimate this, uh, how to obtain the kernel in the Gaussian process. So, and uh, this uh, works were exciting and they opened uh, quite a lot of research. So um, firstly, uh, it's kind of natural to think that the, why not to consider the infinite limit? Because like if we fix a neural network and if we put more hidden units uh, in the neural network, uh, then the performance of the neural network is not worse usually. So if you add a bit of hidden units, it's uh, it will be fine, maybe even better. Um, at least what was 
Fatah, uh, I think, at this time. And uh, so when with this connection to Gaussian processes, this also allows uh, uh, to new computations uh, for um, to for new methods for posterior computations, posterior distribution computations. Uh, there was also these works on neural tangent kernel uh, and the, how uh, um, the researchers started training dynamics and a lot of work on this. And uh, so it also helped to explain some uh, of the phenomena that uh, we already saw before. For example, age of cows. So this is the initialization that helps to propagate the information uh, further. Uh, and uh, they have an assumption that the pre-activations in the neural network follow Gaussian distribution. So which is a uh, kind of the case of the infinite width region. Um, and uh, so, but the problem still was that um, in reality, uh, the Bayesian infinite neural networks, they have poor performance um, compared to their finite counterparts and uh, they're lacking in representation. Uh, so because they, they have this uh, uh, fixed kernel of the Gaussian process and uh, uh, at, the same, uh, at the same time, the transfer learning is impossible. Um, and uh, already in these uh, papers, in the first paper that showed the connection from Bayesian neural network, uh, between Bayesian neural networks and Gaussian processes, they showed that actually when we go deeper, um, so to be closer to Gaussian processes, we need more and more hidden units per layer. So for example, uh, here we can see these uh, curves uh, of all first, second, and third hidden layers. So, and uh, going deeper, uh, the distance uh, is increasing. So we need more number of hidden units to be closer to Gaussian process, as closer to Gaussian process as the previous layer. So, and when we have hundreds of hidden uh, hidden layers, so it's we will have a lot of uh, hidden units per layer to be close to Gaussian process. So, and this, uh, this was the main motivation. So uh, we have the result for the infinite width. And in practice, we have something different. Though uh, we still uh, have quite a lot of research that assumes that we have uh, pre-activations as Gaussians. Uh, and uh, though in reality, we see that uh, um, it's, uh, it's a bit different. So, and this was our motivation, how, or how to describe what we have in reality, so for finite width. And uh, um, so we, uh, I will show you uh, uh, kind of now how it's uh, a bit better in terms of um, uh, maybe logics, but uh, uh, when we started it, we started directly with the describing the tails of the, uh, of the uh, hidden units. Though uh, now I feel it's uh, kind of logical to start maybe to see the really difference and the difference is independence. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I will explain a bit later um, why I think so. So let's start with uh, what I, uh, I mean to study the dependence between hidden units. So if we consider uh, the expression for the hidden union, so um, we have our priors on the uh, random variable. Uh, we have our priors on the weights, and we have the outputs of the previous hidden units. And so the next uh, layer hidden unit is a linear combination of the same outputs of the previous hidden layer. So uh, that means that for different hidden units of the same layer, uh, there is the same uh, random variables inside of the formula of the previous layer. So they, they are dependent. Uh, this is important. It's important. Uh, and this dependency, um, it uh, makes it complicated to describe the distribution. So because we, we cannot uh, obtain the analytical expression. Though um, it was four years ago, it was the case, but uh, actually last year, uh, some researchers obtained the explicit computation and it was done with the major G functions. So um, here is the expression for major G function. Uh, and um, why we cannot we can, why we can describe uh, these hidden units in the neural network through the major G functions uh, because actually the product of Gaussians is a major G function. So uh, if we consider a neural network with a linear activation function, uh, then we just multiply our weight, uh, our weight which is Gaussian, when the subsection of a Gaussian distribution, we multiply it by 
output of the previous layer. So if we have just a, a Gaussian distribution, then the output of the first hidden layer is Gaussian, then we multiply by Gaussian and so on. So in the end, in the nth layer, we will have the product of n Gaussians. And uh, for the linear activation function, uh, this is straightforward. Uh, and uh, here there are two papers that show that uh, this is also the case for uh, relocation activation function. So uh, in the end, uh, we can obtain the exact uh, um, formulas, though they are quite complex. Um, and uh, you can see it. Uh, oops. So, uh, but they're quite complex. So because you can see that we have the integral, uh, we have some products of gammas and so on. So um, not that uh, easy to deal with. And the uh, other way is, uh, of course, to try to approximate this distribution. So uh, if the explicit computation is uh, complicated. And uh, how to approximate it? So we decided to study the dependence between the hidden units to try to describe it and maybe to get some bounds for the distribution. So, and um, as I described already before, this uh, hidden units are dependent. So, and uh, this dependence is due to uh, this, the same uh, random variables of the previous layers. So, and uh, uh, we try to describe it and we assume that we have a symmetric priors and uh, that uh, the nonlinear function is uh, ReLU. And uh, we decided to consider the following function. So we have uh, our random variables uh, on the whole space. Um, and the G and G tilde is uh, the um, two different hidden units of the same layer. And we considered uh, uh, the joint distribution minus the product of this distribution as a function. And uh, this function has uh, quite, uh, quite nice interpretation. So if this function equals to zero, then it means independence. If this function is positive, it means uh, positive dependence. If it's negative, negative dependence. So, and uh, then we try to find the values of, of this function uh, for different hidden units of the same layer and to see if there is independence, positive dependence or negative dependence. So, and uh, what we obtained, we obtained that uh, uh, this delta function can be actually expressed through uh, covariance of these uh, uh, distributions uh, of the um, hidden units given the random bar uh, hidden units outputs of the previous layer. Um, and uh, then these uh, uh, distributions, they, uh, the probabilities, they can be actually uh, rewritten in a way that uh, there are some, one, uh, some functions of the one dimensional input of the norm. And uh, so there is a lemma that uh, uh, if covariance of the uh, to the uh, two functions uh, that are that have the same monotonicity, then this covariance is um, positive. And uh, if the these functions have different monotonicity, then it's uh, negative. And so what we found out is that uh, um, we do have uh, uh, same monotonicity uh, depending on these values of Z1 and Z2 in the probability from which we consider the probability and uh, in the end, we can uh, show that uh, um, for hidden units, two different hidden units, uh, depending on the values, Z1 and Z2 uh, in the probability, we have positive and negative dependence. So, uh, which basically means if we um, see around, uh, if around the variable falls into the tail, like starting from some point, the tail, then the second, uh, another random variable of the same um, layer, uh, uh, hidden unit distribution of the same layer, most probably the value of this would be also in the tail. So this means the positive dependence. And uh, um, we have this uh, dependence structure in uh, for different hidden units. Uh, of the same layer. And we noticed that actually like changing the depth and width, uh, the structure changes a bit. So like if we have uh, more hidden units per layer on the previous layer, then uh, these dependence uh, values, they are a bit more spread. And uh, if we go uh, deeper 
then it's opposite. So it's kind of centered. Uh, so we don't we don't know uh, if it's a good point or bad point or how to describe it or um, like which actually dependent structure we need. So this is what is happening uh, between hidden units in neural network. Question, and, uh, we have, a, we, have a, yeah. we have a clarifying question in the chat, if you don't mind, just taking that real quick. Um, so John M is asking, is the covariance on the output of the hidden layers or is it on the actual values of the weights for each layer? Um, sorry, so the covariance of the outputs. Uh, no, 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 of the outputs, it's of the outputs. So because we, um, it's before training. So when we assume uh, we have just prior distribution and we propagate and what we have of the outputs of the hidden units. So uh, and this is all, everything before training. Uh, and the priors they are assumed to be uh, independent. So the the weights uh, uh, the weights on uh, before training they assumed to be independent. Okay, so uh, that's what we have before training. And uh, then uh, in the end, so we can see already from this plot that uh, actually uh, if we go uh, to the infinite, so if we get the width to the infinite, then uh, indeed our uh, our, our uh, function go, uh, tends to zero. And this means independence. So in the limit, we have an independence. Uh, also computed uh, thanks to this dependence uh, uh, function, we managed to compute the candle star spin row, which are equal to zero. So these are the correlation coefficients. Uh, all, it's all computed for the hidden units of the same layer. So, so distributions of the hidden units of the same layer. So, and this ha has already some, uh, describes some difference. So in the infinite width, in the end, we don't have dependence. We have kind of ten the tendency to independence. And in finite width, we have some dependence. So um, we can try to reason uh, somehow about width depth trade-off. Uh, because uh, this is not clear what we need, uh, though at some point it may be helpful. Uh, but what was most important is that we could uh, use this result to get some tail characteristics of the uh, hidden units. So, and uh, this I will uh, uh, try to descri describe further. So like this, we studied some dependence, we checked how it looks like, uh, um, what it, uh, it, it gave us something, uh, nothing uh, crazy, nothing great, but it was mostly the result helpful for the next result. So what I'm uh, what I'm when I'm talking about that we, when we try to describe the tails, uh, it's mostly that we can uh, when we have a random variable, so we can separate this distribution of the random variable into two parts, uh, into the center and the tail. So when we uh, it's when the distribution is complex uh, or it's complicated to describe it. So we can separate into two parts, the center and the tail. And uh, uh, to deal with the center, to describe the center, we use something like concentration inequalities. If this random variable is a result of uh, a linear combination of uh, other random variables. So, or we can try to describe the tail. And for this, uh, we use some tail characteristics. And uh, quite often it's important to consider a tail uh, because if a tail is heavy, it contains a lot of conformation. And uh, uh, so it's uh, uh, very important for the, for example, um, uh, extreme value theories. So to uh, find uh, the extreme events, uh, uh, they all relied on the uh, tail analysis. So, and uh, we considered uh, uh, the survival distributions. Um, to describe the tails, this is one of the characteristics, uh, one of the ways. And uh, so well, the distributions are the distributions which are generalization of sub-Gaussian and sub-exponential. And uh, so uh, uh, we just take the tail of the distribution and on the right, this is a Babel distribution. So, and uh, theta is a tail parameter. And we can see that uh, uh, for theta equals two, we have a, a sub Gaussian distribution for theta equals one exponential uh, or one, uh, and so on. So in the end, um, 
having a larger uh, theta parameter, we have heavier tails. And uh, so, sub so Gaussian, just as uh, the distribution can be upper bounded by some Gaussian, some exponential upper bounded, some exponential, so on. So, we actually have the property of inclusion because sub Gaussian can be upper bounded by uh, some exponential as well. So, and uh, though uh, here we don't have um, lower bounds, so this is just about the upper bounds. Uh, though uh, to describe this distribution, uh, to, de to describe this uh, subweibel property, uh, there are uh, nice properties of uh, equivalence. So, for example, we can show that if we have this uh, subweibel property, means upper bound by some variable distribution, then the moments can be upper bounded, then the moment generation function can be upper bounded, then um, uh, another uh, moment generation function can be upper bounded at some point. And then if it's uh, true, then we have this upper bound of the uh, distribution. So we have this equivalence of four properties. And basically to show, uh, to show this upper bound uh, of the distribution, what we need is just to show uh, the second uh, property. So to bound the moments of a, of a random variable. Uh, but for this, we need to assume that there is existence of the moment generation function. Uh, then we bound the moments, then we show the upper bounds. So and uh, another way to have the uh, tail characteristics is to describe uh, it through the generalized variable tail. So uh, this is a, a random variable that have both upper and lower bounds. And the difference is uh, a bit on the expression. So here the tail parameter is beta, which is uh, kind of like the inverse of the theta. And it has also slowly varying function inside. And this helps to get the, uh, the lower bounds uh, of the random variables. Uh, so like uh, the slowly varying function is, for example, constant or uh, logarithm is also slowly varying, or some variations, uh, decreasing variations. So, and uh, uh, the generalized variable tail, they also have nice properties, uh, such as multiplication by constant. Uh, it doesn't change the tail parameter. A product of independent random variables, we can calculate the um, tail parameter for the product based on the tail parameters of the random variables that are in the product. And uh, what is important is that we can also describe the sum of dependent random variables under some dependence condition. And this is uh, what was very useful for neural networks. So because we have hidden uh, units that are dependent, and then we can show just that they uh, follow some dependence condition, and we can calculate the tail parameters of uh, these hidden units. And uh, this dependence condition reminds a bit our delta function, which we try to calculate the values and actually showed that uh, this dependence condition uh, um, is, um, uh, we have this dependence condition in uh, for hidden units in neural network, and then we managed to show this uh, property. So we need, uh, uh, there are two ways to show uh, the tail characteristics. First one requires the moments and the second one requires some condition of dependence. And these are the tail characteristics for the sum of random variables, right? So, and uh, there is this a bit of a difference and uh, mostly the difference between them that uh, for the Babel, they have this property of inclusion and Babel tail is precise. Um, not that strictly precise because there is a slowly variant function, but uh, much more precise so because it has some low bound. And uh, so then we managed to show the, this property. So we started with the Babel and we, like in 2019, we showed that uh, uh, the difference between hidden units in infinite width uh, neural networks and finite width neural networks is that uh, in finite neural networks, we have sub -Babel and not uh, uh, a sub uh, random variables. So going deeper, the tail parameter is increasing. That means that the upper bound of a random variable of the hidden units uh, is uh, increasing. Uh, though it's uh, the upper bound. Um, and uh, we had uh, quite a problems to show that uh, there is also a low bound. 
And uh, just because to characterize a sub Babel distribution, we needed to characterize uh, it through the moments. And so we showed the upper bounds uh, and we didn't manage to show the lower bounds. Uh, though, when if we consider a neural network just with one um, hidden unit per layer, then this uh, uh, there will be also a upper bound, uh, a lower bound, sorry, a lower bound. So uh, the, there is a bound from uh, both sides. So that means that the tail is uh, indeed increasing. But once we have more than two hidden units per layer, then uh, it's uh, complicated to show the lower bound because there is this dependence arising inside. So that's why I said uh, before that, firstly, we showed this. And then we, only after we started the dependence because there is this dependence that, um, that was uh, rising uh, between hidden units and did not uh, uh, allow us to describe the lower bounds. But in the end, we described the dependence we obtained. We still believe that this was true and this was the case that we have heavy tailed uh, distributions and increasing the tails with depth. And uh, so we show that it actually generalized with both tail. Uh, and uh, for this, we indeed show that we have this independence property uh, and we managed to show the low bounds. So in theory, we have uh, increasing heavy tails going deeper. And that means that the deeper we go, uh, the further our distribution should be from the Gaussian process because uh, the tails are heavier. So, and uh, this is the important difference between uh, the finite and infinite width, uh, because uh, if we have the heavy tail, heavy tails, then they contain more information and uh, just approximating uh, uh, the distributions by uh, Gaussians will lose a lot of information. So, um, and uh, then the, uh, the next step would be to show uh, uh, theoretically, so we showed theoretically, uh, this is the precise uh, uh, description of the tails. Uh, and now we needed to show it uh, uh, empirically and to try to find if, we, if it's possible to approximate this tail parameter somehow empirically. And uh, uh, in the end, what we have theoretical for the infinite width, we have this tail parameter theta one over two, uh, which is for Gaussian distribution. And uh, for finite width, uh, we have uh, L over two, depending on, on the uh, layer L of the depth, depth of the layer, right? So then we just take the, uh, the definition of the weighable tail, uh, we say that let's say this would be the tail and uh, let's find uh, this parameter of the tail. So we just do uh, minus log of this and uh, again log of this and then we find this uh, uh, beta parameter which is should be one over theta. This is for the variable tail and theta is for a sub uh, this uh, inverse, uh, inverse uh, thing. Uh, and then we try to uh, just sample the distributions and uh, try to estimate the beta parameter. And that's what we saw. So um, if we should have seen that we have this uh, um, tail parameter the same uh, and it should not depend on the width. But in the end, uh, if we increase to the width, uh, this tail parameter uh, decreased. So that means that the, the tail becomes lighter and lighter. That should not be the case. And uh, this was uh, uh, the beginning surprising uh, because it was not what we expected. Uh, for example, for the layer 10, we need to have tail parameter like phi. And then in the end, it was uh, already having just two hidden unit layer, we had already three and so on. So uh, quite, a, quite a difference. And uh, uh, in the end, what that it gave us some idea. So we were kind of blocked. Um, strange that we had this result because uh, this is was this uh, analytically uh, obtained this uh, uh, distributions analytically and this what should be the case. And then there was a paper uh, that come up about the uh, uh, survival concentrations. So, and uh, they showed that uh, if uh, uh, we separate the distribution to center and the tail, 
Then uh, for independent random variables, uh, for subable random variables, um, there should be trans the, there is a transition point such that this transition point it moves further uh for a larger, larger fill parameter and further for more summons so uh means that uh if we have uh, if we increase the number of uh, summons that we do to obtain the our random variable then this transition point goes further and our high tail starts further though the center is kind of gaussian so and uh, this gave us idea so that maybe uh, for our dependent random variables it's also the case uh, though for dependent random variables it's much harder to show the concentration uh, inequalities and then actually going deeper uh, also this uh, transition point moves so maybe for our case as well it will be moving and then this heavy tail starts uh, much further, and actually it's also coherent with this uh, with the Gaussian process uh, limit paper, because then if we have most amounts that in the limit, this transition points moves to the limit. So in the end, we have this center increase to the limit, and we have Gaussian process everywhere. So Gaussian distribution everywhere. So and this would be coherent, uh, though empirically it's much harder to find and much harder to see this transition point. And uh, so you need to estimate uh, um, uh, uh, for the different uh, transition points where they still can start, and then to try to find actually this uh, estimate is still parameter, uh, but starting further and so on. So uh, this was the problem. And uh, this is a uh, future work to do this concentration on inequalities and to prove this theoretically. Uh, for dependent random variables, such as that have a structure of the hidden units, for example. And uh, so also some other perspective that this uh, result could have is, uh, for example, for the initialization. And I wanted just to uh, give quickly uh, how we can use it and um, uh, how um, our theoretical result, even if uh, uh, maybe it's harder to see it in practice. Uh, still, we can improve what we already have. So, for example, uh, for uh, initialization, so there is a theory like that we want to propagate information and to back propagate information. And uh, for this, we want to avoid activations, explosion collapse, and gradient explosion collapse. And there was this um, some initialization that proposed uh, um, techniques to keep it. So uh, if we consider uh, the deterministic inputs, if we consider a correlation between two data points uh, in the neural network. So for this, we need to study variance and covariance. So if we take one input and uh, if we take uh, uh, some hidden unit uh, at some layer and uh, we calculate the variance of the output of this hidden, uh, of hidden unit given this input and covariance, given this input and some other input, then we can get some um, recurrence uh, relations. So uh, if we assume that pre-activations are Gaussians uh, and we have Gaussian initializations and uh, we want to find some good parameters for the variances, for the variances of the weights and biases. And this Gaussian uh, initialization allows and Gaussian preactivations allows to get the recurrence relations for the variance and covariance, and this describes the evolution of the uh, of the input in the neural network. So we don't want to lose the variance. So we don't want uh, activations, explosion, and uh, um, degradation, and same for the gradients. And so we study this variance and covariance. And uh, in the end, uh, there is this um, fixed point uh, for the variance. Uh, they show that there is this fixed point uh, if we have a bounded uh, um, activation function and actually true for the loop function, then uh, uh, the variance is fixed. And then uh, we have this uh, um, age of chaos uh, initialization. So there is this critical line that uh, on the uh, space of uh, uh, variances uh, for the weights and biases, 
which if we take the initialization from uh so this is a critical line between ordered and chaotic phase in order we have um just that if we take different inputs uh and so like we take input and then change this input then in the end the, the outputs of the hidden units will uh will be correlated so uh like all uh, asymptotically correlated that means that uh, the neural network doesn't see this small difference between the small difference between these inputs and uh, uh the other phase chaotic phase is that uh, when we change a bit the neural network, uh, an input in, uh, for the neural network, then the outputs uh, will be decorrelated. So that means that neural network doesn't find any similarities between the inputs, though it should learn there's some similarities. And so there is this, uh, um, if we take initialization between this ordered and chaotic phase, so uh, which, which means that on the, from this critical line, so the, it will help to stay uh, as further as possible between these phases. And that means that it helps to propagate information. That means that the neural network will still try to learn, will, will not end up asymptotically correlated and decorrelated. And it try to learn uh, some similarities and still will see uh, some uh, dissimilarities. So something different from them. And uh, this, uh, this is uh, called the age of cow sensation, and it helps to propagate information deeper in the end. And it helps um, when we choose the variances for the whites and biases from this critical line. And uh, it was done under the assumption that we have Gaussian preactivations. So that means that we are in the infinite with region. And then if we still uh, be able to describe the distribution uh, of the hidden units that we have for finite uh, with neural networks, then we, we actually can update this uh, age of cause initialization that should help uh, to propagate information better, uh, at least uh, uh, theoretically in this way. And uh, this uh, should be uh, the next uh, next work, uh, like to separate the distribution of the center and the tail. So we have this uh, already description of the tail, the center, and we need to find how to describe this uh, um, uh, transition point better so that we can update this age of cause initialization and uh, uh, for better suited neural networks. So for finite with neural networks, because for now it's done under the assumption of the Gaussian reactivations. So, and uh, uh, this were uh, what I described. I wanted also to describe a bit about the regularization, but I think it's uh, out of the scope, just that to know that um, uh, this also can help this description of the hidden units can also help to uh, get some insights about the regularization, though uh, in practice it's hard to see. So theoretically, we can also see that there is some implicit regularization, though there is question, but how to show that there is implicit regularization empirically. So if we cannot really separate even uh, like the real influence of the prior distribution, then how to get this, there is this implicit regularization and so on. So, and um, um, that's what uh, I wanted to to talk to tell you about. So about the previous results, the uh, the results that we got, and uh, about the problems that were stuck a bit, and then how uh, we managed to uh, deal with them and uh, come up with some results and some explanations. Though they are mostly the still future works. So I hope that we will be able to get something more precise. <laughs> Yes, and uh, that's it. I'm ready for your questions, if you have. Thank you. Cool. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, it was a very, very interesting talk. A lot of, a uh, lot of stuff in there. Um, we have some questions in the chat. Uh, so Melanie had a question regarding the edge of chaos initialization. Um, so could you, on a higher level, kind of repeat what that term refers to, essentially? So. The age of chaos, yes. So it's basically here. Age of chaos is that when we are on the edge. So uh, uh, there is, uh, we can, the, uh, the paper basically shows that uh, when we assume that we, there is this uh, uh, 
if we the, if we assume if we take the initialization Gaussian, uh, then we want to choose uh, different variances for the weights and biases. Then the space uh, uh, of these variances that can be separated into, into two regions of the ordered and chaotic phase, and this age of chaos is this critical line in between. And uh, the authors say that we should take an initialization from this critical line uh, because this is something that is between uh, ordered and chaotic. So it's between asymptotically correlated and decorrelated. That means that if we take from initialization from there, so Gaussian distributions with uh, uh, weights and biases from this line, then it will help to propagate the information the further because it will be still learning the similarities and we will be still learning uh, what's the difference between different inputs. Cool, thanks. Um, so I had, a, I had a more meta question um, kind of in the spirit of the seminar series, right? So you started off with um, telling us that um, a good theory is a very practical thing. Um, and then you showed us that, you know, some theories don't actually hold um, that well in practice if you actually do the experiments um, and so obviously like deep learning is, uh, is, is very complicated, right? As a, as a type of machine learning model. Um, and so I guess the question is like, personally, how, how confident are you that we'll ever get to a point where the theory actually catches up with the, with the models that we use or, um, yeah, like, I mean, I guess the, the alternative hypothesis would be that somehow the people that do deep learning and practice and that do the engineering, they always come up with like crazier models that they are more complicated in, in different ways. Um, and the theory community always seems to be a few years behind, right? So like, I don't know, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think this is mostly because uh, uh, so we need to get the results as soon as possible and then seems like to do something empirically is faster than to do something uh, theoretically. So just, um, and then uh, we did something empirically, it works, and then we continue using it and improving and so on. Um, and in this case, and, and now going deeper into theory, they need more and more and more um, kind of, um, so to start to, to, to go deeper in the theory, it feels like it's a bit more complicated because we start with this already complicated explanations and then uh, um, we need uh, to, to know already everything around it and a bit more so that we will be able to adjust uh, uh, like to, to explain it through the different uh, uh, maybe methods. And I think that's uh, so that now we have this arising um, interest from the different uh, um, areas, like uh, physicists that are trying to explain something and they come up with some br brilliant ideas and so on. So, um, or like people who did not study this and then they try to, uh, they saw the connection with uh, some, for example, neural networks and they managed to describe something. And I believe uh, that if, um, so we all try to do, uh, to, to explain uh, the internal processes, internal mechanisms from different viewpoints. And I think this is what uh, is really nice. Uh, though, uh, seems like the technological progress uh, pushes it, kind of helps to push it more with, with the um, implementation. And then uh, though still there are more and more people coming and, and trying to explain, uh, the technological progress still pushes it more with uh, uh, like with something purely empirical and ad hoc that helps at least in this way. So, and I, I think that it will be always the case now that we'll, uh, the theory will still always stay behind uh, because uh, the, the problem now is to get something more work. So more people maybe worry about to make it work than to make it, uh, then the, on the, the question how to work though uh, in still in some industries it's uh, uh, so neural networks are not everywhere 
And in some industries, there is still a logistic regression and so on, because it's uh, very easy to use and uh, everything. So uh, I believe that once we get a really high level understanding of everything and explanation, then it will be much wider use and it will benefit for both sides theory and uh, um, implementation. Uh, though for now we are indeed uh, some years behind. So maybe we need something like a big breakthrough in the theory to really have it, uh, to push it more or uh, for now, we will continue being behind. <laughs> okay, and maybe as a follow up to that, um, do you think there's maybe a role for theory to not only, you know, try to catch up with the models that work in practice and try to understand them, but maybe actually propose kind of different models, right? Like that might be radically different from what people do in practice and say, well, for theoretical reasons, maybe this other completely different type of model would actually work better and try to, you know, inform practical um, explorations of different models in that way. Yeah, yes, yes, for this, I completely agree that, uh, like, the theory in general should not just uh, trying to catch up. And this is what the, the beauty that it's not only uh, try to explain something, but also with explanation, when, since we understand something better, we can do better than at some point like we can change this model in this that goes better in a the theoretical way and so on like uh i don't know for example this uh, i don't know age of cow sensitization so they show that this helps so just empirically we take these parameters and it should propagate information better and so on or like this the initialization that we usually use they he and gloros they also like from because of the theoretical explanations and uh, the people still use it now. So I believe that uh, of course we can from both sides, from theory can grab something from the empirical uh, side that uh, we have a problem, we need to solve it and theory can help with this and uh, vice versa, uh, theory can help to some uh, empirical way. like. Empirical, uh, empirical way uh, implementation helps to understand where we need to go into the theory, what to explain, and the theory helps to change something uh, in implementation that would work better in theory and hopefully better in practice. Though it's not always the case and we need to go, quite often we need to go even deeper in the theory to try to explain it. We have a, we have a question in the chat um, from Fran. Um, Fred, I don't know if you want to just ask it. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, no, just a um, small thing, just uh, towards the end of the presentation, you mentioned like about the implicit regularization that uh, uh, you cannot yeah. see the effect in practice. Uh, um, no, it's not that we cannot see it in practice. It's mostly the question like uh, how really to see, to describe. So um, what I wanted to say that there is a way to describe an implicit regularization, but for hidden units. So when we usually observe the hidden, uh, the implicit, the regularization and implicit regularization for the weights, and uh, we actually have a way to describe it for the hidden units. But then since we try to learn the weights and get posterior distribution for the weights, it's harder to see uh, regularization on the level of units. So mm -hmm. like uh, at some point it's, it's important uh like it's important to see the distributions of the hidden units in general because that's what we are looking for and we're trying to describe uh though since we are more uh weights uh and uh, wanting to find everything from weights this is also the question how to describe the regularization or implicit regularization and the level of units all right makes sense thank you yes thank you I, I had another question also in, again, in light of the, the, the name of the seminar series, of course. Um, so within this whole line of research that you've shown us, maybe what was the point or like a point in which you were personally surprised that something didn't work the way you, you thought it would work initially? Yeah, so actually the, yeah, for me, the most surprising was, of course, this um, result about the tails, this one. <laughs> uh, just that I didn't expect it would be this bad. 
honestly plus that we cannot really see that uh, like the high vitals already like starting from the two hidden units on the like already second hidden layer like okay second maybe it's fine like third hidden layer uh, already like having few so we can really see it on really small neural networks though um so i was mostly thinking that uh, since we this infinite neural networks they really perform worse than the finite uh, with neural networks so i really believe that it could be due to there is a lot of information details and so on and i was really surprised that um well, it's we can really see it for the small neural networks and uh, really in the beginning few hidden units and so on so even if we can adapt the theory somehow uh in, at least this way that empirically we try to estimate the parameter maybe there is a better estimation but this would be was um, quite a disappointment <laughs> yeah interesting and do, and do you think it's in general like in this particular field of, of theory or also in theory in general is it a problem maybe sometimes that people make assumptions without really checking um whether they hold in practice or is that uh, kind of what's what's maybe the importance of like small experiments like this one that you're just showing us um to to make sure that what you're actually modeling is is the right thing um as opposed to like a slightly different problem that you that you can model more easily and that is kind of just mathematically more convenient yeah so i actually i just believe that in general um uh, so it's quite hard to show uh, like you can show something theoretically but then it's hard to show empirically because there are these a lot of uh, um so everything is connected to everything and in the end you show something but you cannot really understand uh, if there is influence of something different and so on i mean uh, so for me the analogy would be like with genetics uh, I don't know. So you have this a lot of genes, and you cannot really understand if it's this very gene is responsible for something. So because there are, uh, uh, it's actually uh, the combination of all the genes which is uh, could be responsible for something, right? And uh, I think a, in practice uh, this is the case. So we can show something theoretically, um, and. Uh, it can it can be true and uh maybe if there was an error before like mathematical intuition still brought us to this uh, result and but in practice there could be a lot of things that um can show that maybe it's not really uh it, it, we cannot really experience this because there are a lot of a lot of uh different problems or uh, different things but we can did not consider in the fear as well and maybe it's not really about the assumptions uh it's mostly that um kind of that there is a so the like for the genes this gene can be responsible for this but there could be also a lot of other genes that could be also responsible for this and to separate really one uh one gene from all the others this is a complicated problem and this i think the uh, same for theory and practice that to do, separate uh one specific thing that we try to show and to try to uh, show it theoretically and to show with empirically this specific thing it can be complicated to show and yes you need to to try to do better experiments to try to find uh like maybe better assumptions in, indeed and uh, so on but uh, yes I, I believe in general it's not trivial and uh, everybody passes for this cool yeah no i think i mean that's that's definitely a very nuanced way of looking at it but also a still a hopeful message for theory so i guess um we're we're all very excited to see where this work will go uh, in the future. And um, yeah, with that, I think we can we can thank uh, Masha again for, for the nice talk. And um, please do keep an eye out on our website. Uh, Fran has just posted this. Um, I think the next seminar in November will be Lena Meyer-Hein, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So that should also be exciting. Uh, and then I hope to see you all again in roughly a month's time. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for listening until the end. <laughs> Thanks, Masha. Thank Cheers. Bye bye. Good luck. <laughs>